Uh, I think we'll go to George Reed's uh, lecture now, and we'll return to the high altitude observations, et cetera, I mentioned afterwards. Well, as everybody knows, uh, magnetosphere ionosphere coupling is, is an enormous subject. We've heard just one or two aspects of it discussed today. <clears throat> and I'm going to discuss just really one or two other aspects, which leaves several hundred aspects completely untouched. And I hope some of these can come out in the later discussion. Uh, <clears throat> my talk is, is really confined to the, the situation taking place in the, uh, the polar caps, in the vicinity of the polar caps. And it must therefore include solar wind coupling as well as simply magnetosphere ionosphere coupling. And I'm sure I, I don't have to apologize for including the solar wind in this session. Disturbed conditions, which is the title of the session, implies time, a time varying situation. <clears throat> and that uh, the time varying situation is an essential element of, of the whole process and uh, will be our chief concern here. As I understand it, the role of a one of the lecturers at, at this conference is to act part as, as a tutorial lecturer and partly as an agitator. And I'll try to do a little bit of both. I'll uh, try to throw in some, some outrageous, controversial stuff, which uh, I'm sure will bring Vitanus leaping to his feet if no one else. And, <laughs> um, what the talk's going to be based on is uh, really an effort that Tom Holzer and I made some two or three years ago to in our own minds to construct a coherent picture of just what happens within the polar cap uh, ionosphere and magnetosphere when the, the driving force for magnetospheric convection changes. <coughs> that is, the, uh, to develop a picture of the, the time-varying response of the polar cap ionosphere and magnetosphere. The ultimate driving force I'm talking about, of course, is the momentum of the solar wind. I don't think anyone would argue with that. There is now accumulating evidence that um, the uh, momentum of the solar wind, in order to be efficiently applied to the magnetosphere-ionosphere system, requires that field line reconnection take place. That is, you can have uh, all the solar wind momentum you want in the absence of field line reconnection. Nothing much is, is going to happen. But once the field lines are reconnected so that we have a direct connection between the interplanetary field and the uh, geomagnetic field, then it, effectively there's, there's a path available for the momentum to enter the magnetosphere and drive the system. Now there's a lot of evidence for field line reconnection these days, and I think uh, the majority of people accept it as a, as a valid process that is in fact going on most of the time, if not all of the time. The first evidence was the uh, the fact that southward magnetic fields were much more effective in, in producing magnetic disturbances of all kinds than northward interplanetary magnetic fields. And I don't need to go over all the multitude of evidence that's accumulated over the past uh, five or six years on that particular subject. It was first pointed out by Hepner back in about 1972 as a result of the OGO, or OGO-6, I think, electric field measurements. Hepner found that when the uh, the Y component of the interplanetary magnetic field had a, a dawn to dusk direction. The convection tended to be confined to the morning side of the northern hemisphere polar cap and to the, the dusk side of the southern hemisphere polar cap. And that the situation reversed when the Y component of the interplanetary field reversed. Now this kind of thing would be awfully hard to understand if uh, field line reconnection were not taking place. In fact, it would be almost impossible to understand, I think. But there's a perfectly simple explanation if one believes in field line reconnection, and it's been pointed out by, by several people. And it is basically that if you look at the, uh, the magnetosphere head on, if you like, from the direction of the sun, you have a northward magnetic field inside the magnetosphere. And if you then apply just outside that region an interplanetary field which has a southward component and at the same time a dawn dusk component like this, then the field lines reconnect in this sense here. And you can see that the tension in the, the resultant reconnected field lines is all directed towards the morning polar cap on this side and towards the dusk polar cap in the southern hemisphere. And similarly, of course, if you reverse the, uh, 
keep a southward field but reverse the, the y component of the field, you get exactly the opposite, uh, the opposite asymmetry in the reconnected field line tension, which is a simple way of looking at the, uh, the asymmetry. And there's clear evidence that, um, that field line reconnection has to be taking place. And the third little piece of evidence, which, which helps in a way, is uh, in a recent study of uh, polar cap magnetic records, Meizawa, I think this, this work's still unpublished, but it's on the verge of publication. Meizawa has, uh, <laughs> I think it is. <laughs> I don't think Meizawa's here. Is it? <laughs> uh, he isolated a few instances in which the interplanetary magnetic field went down to extremely low values of the order of, uh, I think, less than two gammas. But the solar wind uh, uh, momentum flux was, was sort of normal. And in these cases, he found that the uh, current flows over the polar cap were completely consistent with the, uh, the dynamo field, which is excited by uh, thermally driven tides in the ionosphere, and showed rather little evidence for the, uh, the polar cap convection field that, that we normally see. Now, it's, it's the, the, the evidence is not very clear because it, it so happens that the uh, current pattern you expect from the dynamo field is not all that different from the, uh, the convection field, but still it, it, it does look as though in the absence of an interplanetary magnetic field, there is very little momentum transfer. In other words, the old viscous drag of the axford hines days is uh, almost all being provided by direct coupling with the interplanetary magnetic field. I think the next big step is, is that people are, we're, and we're beginning to see evidence for this already, people are beginning to, uh, to find that reconnection is a very patchy process, that it's not something that takes place over a, over a well-defined reconnection line on the day side of the uh, <coughs> magnetopause. And I think, again, intuitively, this is a, a reasonable sort of thing to expect. Reconnection is, is a thing that I feel the magnetosheath plasma would rather not do if it can possibly avoid it. It's, it's much easier for the, the plasma to simply slip around the flanks of the magnetosphere. And anywhere that the topology allows it to do so, I think it, it simply will do so. But anywhere that there is perhaps, a, if you like, an indentation in the nose of the magnetopause for some reason so that the plasma reaches a real stagnation point and can't get away from it. Leave that as one of the outrageous statements. Well, if I could have the first slide. Um, <clears throat> this isn't nearly as elaborate as Walter Heichel has diagrams, but it's, uh, <clears throat> it's enough to to show the purpose, and I'll be showing it once or twice. <coughs> the classical axford hines type uh, theory of uh, convection with reconnection added to the picture, of course, involves a, a southward magnetic field in, in the usual picture, but it, of course it works with any orientation. With uh, solar wind plasma being convected in here towards a stagnation point at which uh, field line reconnection takes place, forming a instantaneous field topology like this. And these field lines then are carried by the solar wind back across the polar cap <coughs> and downwards into the into the tail lobe region where they they reconnect at a reconnection line here. And then the convection proceeds back in towards the earth around the flanks of the magnetosphere and back out to the uh, reconnection point on the day side. <coughs> now that's the <coughs> it's a simple picture, which uh, I don't think people have uh, too many objections to these days. It's something that probably goes on all the time and is part of the uh, part of the the lore of the field, in a steady state at least. This picture requires that there be an electric field in the dawn dust direction that is pointing out of the uh, <coughs> out of the slide in that particular representation, and that. Uh, that electric field must exist over the polar cap where it causes Pedersen currents to flow in the, in the polar cap ionosphere. These Pedersen currents, of course, at the edges of the polar cap are forced to flow up and down the field lines. And these are the, uh, the uh, Birkeland current sheets or the sources of the, the driving current. Now, first of all, I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, 
the situation on these open polar cap field lines. Then later I'll turn to the, uh, the day side closed polar cap field lines here. And lastly, say a little bit about what's happening on the night side uh, closed field lines, which are uh, threading the plasma sheet. The conditions, the boundary conditions, if you like, on all of these sets of field lines are quite different. And the ionosphere, in our view, plays a quite different role in determining the, uh, the motion of the field lines, if you want to talk in, uh, in fluid terminology, or the, the motions of the, the associated frozen in plasma. Well, as I said, in the, in the steady state, there is a, a flow of field aligned current in a sheet downwards on the dawn side across the polar cap and upwards on the dusk side. And various people have alluded this, this morning and this afternoon to the problem of closing that current out in the, in the outer magnetosphere somewhere, or the problem of the, the generator, which is essentially the same thing. <clears throat> now, I, I personally don't see any particular difficulty in uh, closing that current through polarization currents which are flowing out in the magnetosheath plasma or if you like in the solar wind. The, uh, one can put in fairly simple numbers. Oh, uh, although this is a, t a steady state situation, it's important to realize that uh, as far as any particular little blob of solar wind plasma is concerned, it's a time varying situation because it, it enters this picture and, and becomes tied to the, to the Earth at one point, stays tied to it for a time of the order of an hour, and then it's, it's released again. So from the point of view of that plasma, we're dealing with a time varying situation. And uh, dE by dTs can exist. There can be uh, polarization currents, even in a steady state situation as we see it. The, uh, the total area of the, the total uh, diameter of the, or radius of the polar cap affected by the Pedersen current is of the order of 1,500 or so kilometers. So we can calculate the area, of, the total area of the polar cap as pi times 1,500 squared kilometers, if you like. Assume that the Pedersen current flows in a layer which has a depth of the order of 20 kilometers, and assume that the uh, electron density in that layer is of the order of 10 to the fifth per cc. And you find that the total number of ions and electrons, or ions rather, participating in this Pedersen current is something of the order of about 2 times 10 to the 28th ions. Well then, if you, if you map the situation out into the solar wind, the uh, area you're dealing with is some 10 to the 4 times larger. This is the ratio of the two magnetic fields. And the, uh, the number density of the ions out there is of the order of 5 or so per cc, perhaps under normal conditions. And the depth of the region, I would maintain you can guess at by saying that the depth is roughly the distance that an, an alphane wave would travel in the time that a field line remains connected to the Earth's ionosphere, that is in a time of the order of an hour or so. And that depth turns out to be something of the order of 5 times 10 to the 5 kilometers. And you can multiply these figures together again, and you find that the total number of solar wind ions participating or supplying this Pedersen current, or the total number potentially capable of supplying it, is something of the order of 2 times 10 to the 32. And there are only 2 times 10 to the 28 participating in the ionosphere. So that uh, there's lots of, uh, it's not hard to conceive of these Pedersen currents being driven by, by polarization currents in the solar wind of very low current density. In the course of closing, now these currents have to flow presumably along the surface of the tail through the what's now being called the boundary layer of the mantle. And uh, well, in the vicinity of the of the tail magneto magnetopause. And there, of course, since they're field aligned currents, they have to impart a twist to the tail field lines. And uh, I don't know that whether there's any real evidence for a, a twist of the necessary magnitude, but it's something that uh, should perhaps be looked for. <clears throat> and I'll, I'll, <clears throat> I'll come back to mention perhaps some of the consequences of a twist of that kind. 
Well, this is the steady state situation, which I'm not supposed to talk about at all, but uh, I sort of had to bring it in. Well, what happens when the, <clears throat> when the driving force at the nose of the magnetopause here changes? And I'll, uh, I'll assume that that means a change in the reconnect field line reconnection rate. Well, the second slide illustrates the situation. <clears throat> No, no, again, this is the steady state situation. This is looking down on the, on the northern polar cap. We have a field-aligned uh, current sheet coming down on the dawn side of the polar cap, flowing across here and flowing back up here. And this, this Pedersen current flow is actually shown in this right-hand portion here. The uh, ionospheric space charges determine what the flow of, of ionospheric current will be. And I've completely omitted in this the uh, existence of a second current sheet at lower latitudes associated with the alphane layer or with pressure gradients in the ring current. And, but they don't uh, conceptually affect this, uh, this picture at all. Here, is, here are the equipotentials of that same system, which means the plasma flow lines, the plasma convection directions across the polar cap. And this, again, is the old classical axford hines picture with the Earth's rotation effects uh, removed. Well, now, what happens when, uh, when the field line reconnection rate changes in the vicinity of the, the dawn polar cusp region here? What happens, first of all, of course, is that an alphane wave or something like an alphane wave is launched down the reconnected field lines, <coughs> informing the plasma as it goes that there's a dE by dt accompanied with it, that the field is changing. And that excites a polarization current, J, which is proportional to dE by dt. And the Lorentz force, J cross B, associated with that current then starts to accelerate the plasma in the uh, anti-solar direction to try to get it up to the new speed that the reconnection rate is demanding. Flux must be pulled out of the reconnection region at the same rate as it's being pushed in. <coughs> well, when this wave reaches the uh, the current, the dynamo region of the ionosphere, the Pedersen currents start to interfere with it, of course. And there's, a, well, in radio wave terminology, a mismatch occurs. And a reflected wave travels back up, telling the solar wind that it, it can't get going, and the solar wind should slow down. Well, the solar wind doesn't want to do that, of course. It's much more powerful, so it uh, launches another wave back down. And there's a successive uh, series of reflections of these waves until the whole thing reaches a, a steady state. And this whole picture was first analyzed by Heinz and Story many years ago, back about 1958, in the course of a lengthy argument with uh, Gene Parker in the pages of JGR. And uh, more recently, it's been worked out in greater detail by, uh, by Scholler in the course of analyzing the uh, the motion of a barium plasma cloud released on a field line. The plasma cloud, of course, is a much lighter thing than the solar wind, but the same, the same sort of effects uh, occur. And there's a succession of reflections, and uh, depending on the mass of the plasma cloud, it can either oscillate back and forth until it reaches a steady state determined by the ionosphere, or if it's a very heavy one, it can uh, exponentially build up its, its speed and drag the ionosphere along with it. The physics of the situation is the same as the physics of the uh, changing reconnection rate situation. OK, then, this, uh, this alphane wave succeeds in <coughs> establishing a new ionospheric space charge field. And that's shown in the next slide. Now, to begin with, this field, this increased uh, field, exists only at the uh, dayside edge of the, uh, of the polar cap, that is, in the polar cusp region. It, nothing, nothing back here knows about it yet. And what I've drawn here are the equipotentials associated with this increased electric field. And uh, to get the, the total picture, of course, you have to add these equipotentials to the one shown in the last diagram, which are the equipotentials associated with all these uh, space charges back here. And, but the, the, the important consequence of this kind of uh, electric field topology is that you can see that field lines in this region here, for instance, which are closed field lines, they're inside the, uh, they're on the low latitude side of the polar cap. 
These are dragged around, torn away from the edge of the polar cap, if you like, brought around here and pushed through the reconnection region, and they become open field lines. And as the uh, open field lines are dragged across the polar cap by the solar wind, they gradually establish this new electric field structure the whole way across, so that gradually the, uh, the uh, electric field and the potential drop and everything else adjusts itself to a new steady state situation like the previous one, but with, uh, with larger electric fields as the reconnection rate has increased. Now, here we differ a little bit from the picture presented by